Okay. So the easiest, uh, the most common fungal infections we know are Candida and Aspergillus. Uh, one uh, is a yeast, other is a mold. But other less common infections are Cryptococcus, uh, Histoplasmosis, Zygomycetes, uh, Sporotrichosis. Among these, uh, Cryptococcus is also a kind of a yeast. But one of the most common molds, other than Aspergillus, is Zygomyces, or what we call as Mycosis. So that's once uh, another mold which is becoming very common in India. Uh, it is seen mainly in patients uh, who undergo stem cell transplants, AML patients undergoing aggressive chemotherapy, and also diabetic patients. So India is fast becoming diabetic capital of the world, we all know, and Zygomyces has a particular predilection for patients with diabetes. You know, very common to see rhino-orbital mycosis uh, in diabetic patients. So any patient of diabetes who suddenly has a loss of sense of smell or there is a black ishar developing inside the nostril should always check for uh, zygomyces. And usually these people have uh, deranged immune systems and also uncontrolled uh, diabetes. So you have to remember these. So most common are candida, aspergillus, I will say cryptococcus in HIV patients, you know, and zygomyces. Okay. I, I love this slide. I borrowed this slide from one of uh, uh, professors uh, in Germany who came to deliver a lecture on antifungal. So he said we can divide the overall antifungal treatment strategies into this, uh, you know, kind of a two by two table. So there are four paradigms, prophylaxis, empiric, preemptive and targeted. And on the uh, other axis, we have to see high risk, sign symptoms, radiological or serological evidence and culture. So what is profile axis? It is fear driven, right? The only thing which is present here is there is high risk, okay? So a patient who is going for uh, aggressive chemotherapy in AML, is at high risk of developing fungal infections. You know, if you are going to any African country today, you are at risk of yellow fever. So you need profile access. So it's high risk, okay? So which is fear driven. Next is fever driven. Okay, we know one of the most common features of fungal infections, uh, it's no different from bacteria, it's fever. Okay, patient. Uh, you can't explain this fever. Patient is on two antibiotics, still is uh, spiking fever. So there is high risk, plus there is sign and symptom in terms of fever. There is usually no radiological or serological evidence. And of course, culture is not there. Then comes preemptive therapy, which is evidence driven. Now, in addition to high risk and maybe some sign or symptom, there is a definite serological or a radiological evidence. Now, what is the serological? Uh, in India, there is a beta glucan test. Uh, I don't know if it's available now in SGPGI. It detects fungal infections, both candida and aspergillus. It is, it is about beta glucan test. Okay, it's a serological test. Or galactomenon test, which is only for aspergillus. And radiological is more suitable for aspergillosis, where you see uh, the cotton ball sign, uh, you know, the various radiological features of aspergillosis. So there is some evidence, what we call as preemptive therapy, but still there is no confirmatory diagnosis. There is no culture. There is no histopathology. And finally, targeted, which is the gold standard. Either you get the blood culture or a tissue culture positive or biopsy is positive. Okay, that's a targeted therapy. Uh, uh, maybe at some point of time, I would love to talk about all these four paradigms in neutropenic and non-neutropenic patients. That's another uh, one to two hours uh, topic, but maybe at some other time. But right now, I think this should help you that what are the four treatment paradigms? Uh, what is an ideal antifungal agent? First of all, it should be fungicidal. Broad spectrum should cover candida and aspergillus. High tissue concentrations, low toxicity, low rate of resistance, oral and IV formulations, and IV should be inexpensive. What are the different agents available? Uh, again, like bacteria, we have cell wall inhibitors. You have echinocandins in that class. Uh, you have cytoplasm, uh, which acts on the cytoplasm, all the azoles, DNA inhibitors, 5-chlorocytosine, 
and of course drugs which act on cell membrane which is amphotericin b uh, and ambisome and that type of drugs okay okay what is the susceptibility pattern now please remember this uh, even without focusing on the slide when we talk of candida the candida word is divided into two candida albicans and non albicans okay now the susceptibility pattern also is divided into these two classes so albicans on one side non albicans on the other among candida non albicans there are four species which are most common candida tropicalis glabrata cruzia parasilosis and now in india uh, which is very common is candida humulonae or candida oris okay i'm repeating most common species in candida non albicans are tropicalis glabrata cruzia and oris oris is not on this slide but remember candida oris is very common okay look at albicans everything covers albicans all azoles Uh, amphotericin B a kind of it. Everyone covers albicans. The drug of choice for albicans remains fluconazole. Remember high dose, not 150 mg to 50 mg BD. No, you idly give if a patient has uh, systemic infection because of albicans, give 400 to 800 mg loading dose and then 400 mg maintenance. Okay. Tropicalis is one of the most common uh, species in India. So fluconazole covers tropicalis, but the resistance rate is inching towards 10-15%. We had a paper from PGI Chandigarh. Uh, fluconazole had 12% resistance in tropicalis. Uh, guys, remember one thing. There is a cutoff of 20%. You know, in microbiology, we say 20% is that particular benchmark. When the resistance crosses that barrier, it becomes very alarming. Why 20%? Because the moment the resistance crosses 20% barrier, the susceptibility of that antibiotic or antifungal falls below 80% right and that is when you cannot use that or should not use that drug as an empirical therapy for a drug to be used as empirical therapy at least its susceptibility has to be 80% plus so any resistance level bacteria or fungal when it inches towards 20% and crosses that that's when it becomes alarming so in tropicalis still fluconazole is 10 12% resistance uh and of course uh, itra gori aposta conazol amphocas so all cover uh, tropicalis so even drug of choice for tropicalis is fluconazole unless you have data from your own hospital that the resistance is very high okay candida paracelosis again fluconazole uh, is a as is sensitive paracelosis is common in children for some reason okay and we say the more the plastic in body a uh, central line urinary catheter more the chances of paracelosis again uh, fluconazole is uh, sensitive and you can use that now we come to troubled waters which is glabrata and cruzia so first of all remember glabrata and cruzia you should not use fluconazole okay ideally you should not use any other azole also for glabrata and cruzia unless uh, you have uh, detailed susceptibility charts but for glabrata and cruzia drug of choice has to be a kind of antibiotic okay and finally candida oris which is not shown here uh, that's a very sinister can, uh, fungal pathogen resistant to almost everything sometimes it is resistant to even a kind of antibiotic amphotericin b is also resistant many times so that's a very difficult pathogen to treat still we use a kind of candidates for them or sometimes uh, we see the susceptibility patterns so this is the general susceptibility that we see but again uh in microbiology you cannot borrow anything from your neighboring hospital also forget global so i would urge all of you to ask your microbiologist to give you the susceptibility patterns of different antifungals uh for your hospital very quickly one or two lines amphotericin b deoxycholate you all know uh still remains uh the most broad spectrum antifungal uh more than 50 60 years old gold standard drug of choice for glucor still remains Uh, the only problem with this drug you know is nephrotoxicity you know uh, there are papers now which say 30% of the patients develop acute renal failure on amphotericin b uh, it covers everything all candida uh, minus candida oris uh, all aspergillus it covers uh, mucor it covers uh, some people say if you give a continuous infusion over 24 hours in saline free loading 
reduces nephrotoxicity. I mean, that's okay. Uh, so in patients who cannot afford MB-Zome, uh, you can still uh, use amphotericin B, but most of the guidelines have de-emphasized this mainly because of the toxicity. So just remember, the efficacy of amphotericin B deoxycholate is same as MB-Zome. The only difference is less toxicity. This lipid associated all or there are three versions, lipid associated, liposomal, and there is one more. So all are lipid associations. The only advantage of this is that they cause less nephrotoxicity. Okay. Nephrotoxicity is not absent, but less. Okay. But these are one of the most expensive uh, amphotericin B or even antifungus. Fluconazole, the good old drug, uh, still remains drug of choice for most uh, superficial infections or even systemic infections caused by Candida albicans. But please use high dose in the beginning as a loading uh, if you want to use this drug for systemic mycosis. Candida glabrata cruzii should not be used. Protoxicity is good, but drug, inter drug interactions are common. So your anti-cancer patients are on many uh, drugs. And remember, azoles are very notorious for drug interaction, especially voriconazole. You know, uh, so just remember that. Itraconazole, uh, again, uh, somewhere here, somewhere there, kind of an antifungal, covers yeast and mold. The problem with itraconazole is GI tolerability is very less. It's not easy to take this drug. It still covers aspergillus. So it's a cheap option still. Uh, but the problem is a GI acceptance of this drug. Voriconazole, uh, it's a drug of choice now for aspergillosis. Uh, covers candida, glabrata and cruzia are question mark, but covers aspergillus as well. Does not cover mucor, so remember that. Uh, it has a good CNS penetration. IV boricone, as you know, boriconazole is one of those drugs which has a good uh, IV and oral conversion uh, because bioavailability is not much difference. IV boriconazole is nephrotoxic uh, because of a cyclodextrin molecule in that. It has a lot of drug interactions with the NTTB drugs and you can see with the uh, carbamazepine and cyclosporin. You have to take a look at the liver functions when you use them. And many people say, uh, if you can check the blood levels, it is advisable to check the blood levels of oriconazole if you are using it in uh, in sick patients with aspergillosis. Okay, so that's oriconazole for you. Posaconazole is a new drug, not new anymore, but I think now the oral, uh, it's, it was available in oral solution form. But I guess now oral tablets are also available, at least in West. Again, broad spectrum, broader than boriconazole. It covers mucor also in addition to uh, aspergillosis. It's a drug of choice for profile access in neutropenic patients. So remember, if you have to give in allogenic BMT or in patients with the AML, undergoing induction chemotherapy, posaconazole is a drug of choice now. A1 recommendation in most, most guidelines for profile access. Okay. It's also as a reserve therapy for mucormycosis. It has less drug interactions than body. Uh, there is a new drug, isovaconazole. I'm not sure if uh, it's uh, available in India. Uh, I don't know. But isovaconazole, again, is like posaconazole, covers mucor, covers aspergillus. And it is fast uh, uh, increasing its presence in the guidelines. You know, it's inching towards boriconazole uh, to be becoming the drug of choice for uh, aspergillosis. Caspofungin is one of the first uh, akinocandin, very broad spectrum, covers candida aspergillus, covers all. Remember, akinocandins cover all candida, ex, uh, all yeast except cryptococcus. Okay. They don't have a good penetration in I and CNS. Uh, okay, you're not Hello. Okay. Toxicity is minimum, but you have to give a loading dose. The biggest advantage of these drugs is no dose adjustment in renal dysfunction. So if you're in ICU, you can sleep well, irrespective of the patient's renal parameters, uh, you can give this drug. Okay. Mycofungin is sister drug, caspofungin. Uh, again, it has been FDA approved addition to Candida, but also for profile access. Uh, there are some reports of liver tumors in rats, but again, uh, it's light sensitive. Also remember that, but very much like a sister drug of uh, caspo. Anibula fungin, the only advantage of anibula fungin over caspo and mica is that it is hepatostain. I think there was a connection issue we uh, missed almost 
from Casper for me. Uh, so there was some connection. In, yeah. Okay. 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 So mica fun. Uh, a mica fungin is almost similar as Casco. Uh, there are some reports of liver tumors in rats, uh, but again, uh, there is the, the black box warning for that. So you have to reduce the dose in patients with hepatic uh, dysfunction. Uh, anadula fungin, the main advantage of anadula fungin over Casco is that it is hepatosafe. So if you really want to sleep well as an intensivist, not wondering about liver and kidney levels and you have to treat the patient with systemic candidiasis, anadula fungin is a good option. Otherwise, efficacy-wise, it remains same as Casco and Mika. A quick table to compare a mechanism, formulation, renal insufficiency, hepatic CSF and urine. Uh, I think this is self-explanatory. It's a good table as a ready reference uh, if you want to compare different antifungal agents. Again, a uh, quick look at the in vitro activity of different antifungals. Broadest spectrum antifungal is, so I'm making no one-liners. If you want to make, you can make your notes. One, broadest spectrum antifungal is amphotericin B. First pearl. So I'm just giving you some pearls and pitfalls. Broadest spectrum antifungal is amphotericin B. Drug of choice for candida albicans is fluconazole. Drug of choice for aspergillosis is voriconazole. Drug of choice for candida non-albicans is akinopendins. Drug of choice for prophylaxis in neutropenic patients is ozaconazole. Drug of choice for mucormycosis is liposomal amphotericin. Okay, so these are some of the pearls and pitfalls or the summary of our antifungal. Uh, one chart on the dosing recommendations. Just see uh, most of the echinocandins need a loading dose. Okay. Even liposomal amphotericin B, when we give, we start with a higher loading dose and then followed by the other dose. Azoles, uh, if you are giving in sick patients, uh, the recommendation is to check their blood levels. Uh, again, this table, I mean, if you want, you can stick this table that prophylaxis is empiric targeted different drugs, which one is the drug of choice, which one is second choice, first choice. So this is a good option. This is what I just uh, repeated previously. I'll again repeat. Drug of choice for prophylactic in neutropenic patients, posaconazole. Drug of choice for empiric use in non-neutropenic patients. If patient is very sick, akinocandins. Not very sick, fluconazole. Drug of choice for empirical use in neutropenic patients is akinocandins or amphotericin. Drug of choice for candida non-albicans, akinocandins. Drug of choice for confirmed aspergillosis, voriconazole. Drug of choice for mucormycosis, posaconazole. Okay. So this was very quickly a brief about antifungals. I'll just stop here. Any questions, comments, happy to answer before I shift to antimicrobial stewardship. No questions. Nobody. You can use your mic and ask. Hmm. No, I don't suppose so. You go, okay. go to the other one. Okay. Ma'am, can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Done. Good. Right over. Now I come to my favorite topic, antimicrobial stewardship, the aspirin of 21st century. Okay. See, how many of you have read uh, Homo sapiens from Yuval Harari? I'm sure there are few hands in the audience, you know. One of the most widely read books in the last five years. There are two volumes, Homo sapiens and Homo deus. Okay. Uh, Yuval Harari writes, famine, epidemics, and war. These have been the three biggest killers of humanity since time in the movie. Okay. And you can count the last thousand years. Okay. And almost every 200 years, there has been a major epidemic. In the 14th century, the big plague of Europe, 220 million people died. 
Then after 200 years, 16th century, smallpox killed 20 million people. 19th century, about 400,000 people died of flu and TB. Then in the 20th century, the famous Spanish flu. And now we know, of course, the COVID. So you can see epidemics have been one of the biggest killers. Now look at the difference which antibiotics have made in this mortality. The first antibiotic was used commercially in 1941-42 in the Second World War. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. It was still not commercialized. He discovered penicillin in 1929. You know, it was a serendipitous discovery. But it was not commercialized in 1941. Okay. Till in the Second World War, you saw the patients with, uh, the soldiers with gunshot wounds Staph aureus infection started dying. That's when, for the first time, you started using uh, ampicillin on a uh, sorry penicillin on a large scale. Okay, so the story of antibiotics is hardly eight years old. We are in 2023. The first use was 1941-42. So it's just an 80-year-old miracle. And look at the difference: the impact of antibiotics on historical mortality. Look at endocarditis. 75% reduction in the mortality after the antibiotics came into being. Pneumonia, 30% reduction. Brain infection, 60% reduction. And just compare the last statistic. Myocardial infarction treatment with aspirin and streptokinase has only reduced mortality by 3%. Okay. Now compare this with antibiotics. Okay. So, I think this class of drugs has still the biggest impact in the history of mankind so far. No drug has been able to save more lives than antibiotics. You know, what was the uh, average life expectancy of India when we got uh, independence? 40, 37 to 40. And today we are closing to 73, 74. I stay in Singapore, the average life uh, expectancy is 84. But 50, 60 years ago, this was half than this. And one of the major reasons is antibiotics. Okay. So I always say we have to pass four things to our next generation. Clean air, clean water, fuel, and antibiotics. And all four are in danger. Okay. And if some of you are dozing off in this lecture, we are missing out on this very important class of drugs which you have to pass to your project. Okay. So one uh, another reason to listen attentively to this uh, very fascinating story. I'm going to tell you a story of antibiotics. This is not an educational lecture. This drug is, uh, it, it's, it's a Bollywood soap opera, the rise and the fall of antibiotics. Look at this, antibiotics. There was an age of ignorance, okay, before 1920s. We did not know. There was witchcraft, there was whatever. Uh, there was upri hava, as used to say, for infection. And then came the golden age, which was discovery of um, streptomycin, penicillin in 40s. And then 40s to 70s was the golden period. This was like... Uh, you know, the honeymoon, the playground of antibiotics for these 30 years, 1940 to 1970. Uh, so all your uh, cephalosporins, first, second generation, amoxicillin, uh, they were all discovered during this time. And can you imagine such was the aura of antibiotics? There was a uh, guy who made a prophecy in 1969. His name was William Stewart. He was the U.S. Surgeon General. He made a prophecy in 1969. What did By the year 2000, we would have closed the book on infectious disease. Bhai sahab ne rishavani kar di that by the year 2000, there will be no infectious disease. Can you imagine the glory of antibiotics during those days? Okay. And see how horribly he has gone wrong that now WHO says that by the year 2040, we may enter a post-antibiotic era. Look, after 100 years, 
that period before 1941 is known as pre antibiotic era 2040 we may enter that era again okay aur jis tarah se humne azithromycin aur doxycycline use kiya hai na covid mein i can tell you the resistance this 2040 may have been advanced now even 5 6 60 years or even okay rampant misuse of azithromycin and doxy and even meropenem in icu for covid patients but anyway so that was the time and one of my teachers used to say antibiotics are the victims of their own success okay so kya hua 1970s 80s ke baad mrsa the first resistant pathogen then esbl the second resistant so resistance started coming up now i am from pharma industry and pharma industry looks at roi when you take 15 years to develop a drug and bacteria can become resistant in 15 days where is the revenue so after 1980s pharma industry started moving away from antibiotics the age of neglect started aur usi time pe aa gaya chronic disease depression alzheimers diabetes hypertension hypercholesterolemia cash cows the biggest drug till date is atorvastatin 150 billion dollars atorvastatin has earned in its life span okay uh, the biggest antibiotic so far has been ceftriaxone okay by the way in terms of revenue but uh, after 80s pharma company started neglecting antibiotic because the resistance was high they said why spend a billion dollars in developing one drug and bacteria takes a fortnight to become resistant then in the beginning of this century started the age of reality ke nahi bhai agar antibiotics nahi bachenge we would jeopardize the advancement in medicine can you imagine what will happen to chemotherapy hip and knee replacements we all do these procedure with the guarantee of antibiotics right so if the resistance is so high the advancements in the modern medicine will be jeopardized that is what we are staring today okay just see the rise the fall and hopefully the rise again touch wood uh, of antibiotics in future that's the fascinating story of this class of drugs okay so how do we define antimicrobial resistance now it's a uh, this is a, a very good slide i again copied borrowed this slide from one of our professors in chennai he says antibiotics is a societal resource ठीक है तीन चीजें हैं यूज ओवर यूज एंड एब्यूज एनीथिंग विच इज अटल रिसोर्स वॉटर फ्यूल इलेक्ट्रिसिटी यू नो दे आर ऑल सोसाइटल रिसोर्सेज सो वी हैव टू यूज दम टू डिशियसली सो दिस इज द बैलेंस वी हैव टू कीप इफ यू यूज फॉर एन इंडिविजुअल कंट्रोल इन्फेक्शन रिड्यूज मॉर्बिटी सेव लाइफ बट द कोलेट्रल डैमेज ऑन द सोसाइटी रेजिस्टेंस इज इंक्रीजिंग more cost uh you know so we have to maintain this balance between use overuse and abuse because remember antibiotics is a societal resource you can't use it with your own whims and fancy okay now very beautiful slide it explains so maine kal bataya tha ki there is something known as selection pressure now what is selection pressure selection pressure is the pressure exerted on the resistant mutants to get selected out okay easy bhasha mein samajhte hain look at the first circle the purple bugs and there is a one with a red outline now nature has prepared bacteria and every one of us to survive so in nature there are certain wild mutants which are well prepared then the other strains because nature ne unko ek protective mechanism diya hai they are known as mutants okay they are resistant so maybe in a population of uh, 10 raised to per 5 bacteria there are one or two mutants okay doesn't matter that's a natural balance but when i give my antibiotic it kills all the sensitive pathogen but this one mutant that is preserved now what will happen this mutant pressure has been exerted on it to select it out it will start growing and it will start imparting this ability this raksha kavach to its progeny 
So initially the whole milieu, okay, the inoculum, which was full of sensitive bacteria. Now the inoculum is full of resistant mutant bacteria. This is known as selection pressure. This is the most common reason or the philosophy behind antibiotic resistance. That is why we say the more you use antibiotics, the more you lose them. Okay. So understand why we say that misuse, overuse of antibiotics will develop resistance because wild mutant strains will get selected out and they will start producing their own kind. And the second is collateral damage. Okay. I'm sure you have seen, uh, I think, Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger's movies for collateral damage and we talk it in terms of war. You know, uh, there is a beautiful Hollywood movie also on this that if you, uh, you know, these guys sitting in their uh, Florida or Texas uh, uh, war rooms, uh, they drop bombs through drones, you know, uh, and that is based upon some information that maybe this is the vehicle in which there are terrorists. But suppose that vehicle is close to a public school. What do you do? Right. And suppose you drop the bomb and the school is in the periphery of that, you may have collateral damage, right? That's how we understand collateral damage. The same thing happens in antibiotics. Now, suppose a patient uh, is having pneumonia, okay? Most common cause is streptococcus pneumonia, right? For a community to add pneumonia. But suppose this patient is also smoker, uh, and he has pseudomonas in his lungs, lying as commensal. You know, our, our gut is as uh, tender than bacteria. You know? So, but that pseudomonas is sitting shanti, say, in the lungs, doing nothing. Now, when I give a broad spectrum drug to kill streptococcus pneumonia, but this drug also covers pseudomonas, it unnecessarily irritates pseudomonas, collateral damage. So, what will happen? Streptococcus pneumonia will be killed. But this pseudomonas is now irritated unnecessarily. It, it thinks that, yes, I am being attacked. So what does it do? It starts to develop a resistance mechanism. Now tomorrow, if the patient gets an infection with the pseudomonas, it will be a resistant pseudomonas and the normal drug which we use will not be working. That's collateral damage. So why do we say that use specific use narrow spectrum antibiotics because we don't want to increase collateral damage. Bacteria say either kill us or leave us alone. Don't irritate us. When we unnecessarily use broad spectrum antibiotics, we irritate them. We induce them to develop resistance. And then when we such major infection, our carbapenems, peptides don't work and then we have to use policy. So remember this basic premise behind resistance. Selection pressure collateral. Okay. I'll just stop here because I know this is a sa complex sa concept. Hai. Uh, maybe I have tried to simplify it, but just in case any questions, happy to answer. No, nothing. Chale aage. Kahani interesting hai. Okay, right. Okay. I really value this guy, Jim O'Neill. Hmm? Uh, this guy, Jim O'Neill, uh, is an economist. He was an economist with Goldman Sachs Bank. Okay. 2013, uh, the then British Prime Minister, David Cameron, he asked this guy, Jim Oni, who was his advisor, can you do a review on antimicrobial resistance in the world? And this guy wrote five beautiful papers. And why his contribution is so immense, it was only after this paper and this one slide that the Western world started to worry about resistance. I am in this field since 2007. And I know I used to shout from the rooftops when I used to lecture uh, in Europe or in US about antibiotic resistance. And these guys should say, oh, come on, this is a third world country problem. Okay. Uh, we, we don't have a resistance issue. And this was just 15, 20 years ago. But as soon as this paper came up and he gave this statistic, 
देखो पैसा बोलता है है ना सो ही गेव ए नंबर टू रेजिस्टेंस ही सेड इफ वी डू नॉट टेक एनी स्टेप्स बाय द ईयर टू 2050 10 मिलियन एक करोड़ लोग मे डाई ऑफ एएमआर एंड दिस नंबर वुड बी बिगर देन कैंसर एंड डायबिटीज पुट टुगेदर not only this the world is going to lose 100 trillion dollars in gdp bas jaise ye paper aaya after two years of this the un general assembly had a separate session on antibiotic use pichle 3 4 saal se every year un general assembly talks about aim you know the gain act the path act uh, even obama issued this some statement so the whole world western world started talking about resistance because of this one paper okay. many people say this is a very alarming statistic i said that's okay it's good to err on the side of caution okay so this was uh, the uh, when the world wake up to aim so we have bad bugs no drugs this article came up around 20 years ago and we say there is no escape so this is a mnemonic for these uh six important pathogens enterococcus staph aureus klebsiella acinetobacter pseudomonas and enterobacter species okay so these are the important resistant pathogens that we have ha ji ab hum uh ma'am banani ma'am if you can hear me i tend to talk little bit in hindi beech beech mein i hope people can understand most of the people can understand hindi in this room sir we are fine okay cool right so okay Now, ये बड़ा इंपॉर्टेंट है समझना कि व्हाट इज एमडीआर एक्सडीआर एंड टीडीआर बिकॉज क्वाइट ऑफन वी यूज दीज टर्म्स इंटरचेंजेबल व्हाट इज एमडीआर मल्टी ड्रग रेजिस्टेंट ए बैक्टीरिया व्हिच इज रेजिस्टेंट टू थ्री और मोर क्लासेस ओके सो मे बी इट्स रेजिस्टेंट टू बीटा लैक्टेम फ्लोरोकैनोलोन माइनोग्लेप्स ओके थ्री और मोर क्लासेस इज एन एमडीआर एक्सडीआर रेजिस्टेंट टू एवरीथिंग एक्सेप्ट वन और टू क्लासेस so usually anything which is carbapenem resistant we call it xdr kyunki wo sirf tg cycline aur cholesterol ko sensitive hota hai pan drug resistant resistant to everything under the sun isme kya karna hai kuch nahi karna hai bhajan karna hai pray karna hai right right so that is pan drug resistant acinetobacter is fast becoming pan drug resistant guys okay. many hospitals in india have even i, I know i data from china and other carbapenem resistant acinetobacter is 80% plus i know the data from certain indian hospitals cholesterol resistance 20 percent to upar hota so we have to remember this mdr xdr pdr now what are the common bugs mdr mein we will say esbl mrs the mc and i will talk about them later what is this they are mdrs anything which is carbapenem resistant we call xdr और इसमें तीन नाम इंपॉर्टेंट है सीआरई सीआरपीए एंड क्राम सीआरई कार्बापेनम रेजिस्टेंट एंटेरोबैक्टीरियासी सीआरएबी कार्बापेनम रेजिस्टेंट एसिडोबैक्टर बोमेनाइ एंड सीआरपीए इज कार्बापेनम रेजिस्टेंट सुडोमोनास एरिया ओके ये देखो डब्ल्यूएचओ ने 2017 में ये रिपोर्ट निकाली दीस थ्री आर द टॉप मोस्ट क्रिटिकल बग्स फॉर व्हिच वी नीड न्यू एंटीबॉडी CRE, CRPA, and CRAM. Okay, then there are high priority, medium priority, but these three are the major drugs. Yeah, these are some of the new drugs which have come up in the last five years. Okay, so look at uh, this. Uh, okay, इससे जाने से पहले इस इस स्लाइड को ना बाद में देखो, because you will get confused. Okay, हाँ जी. India, the hotbed of AMR. We are fast becoming the world champions in diabetes, world champions in cardiovascular diseases, but we are also notoriously the world champions in AMR. This is a beautiful paper published by Lancet last year. Look at this data. MRS say methicillin resistant Staph aureus. This we have touched yesterday. Staph aureus, which is resistant to methicillin or oxacillin. it is resistant to all beta lactams drug of choice is vancomycin ticoplanin lenalidomide okay now ye badi interesting cheez hai kyun dekho uh, mrsa se western word badi achhi tarah jaan kar rahe 
West is worried about, was worried about MRSA only till 20 years ago. Okay. This was the first resistance they found in 70s. Okay. And in India, we thought our problem is gram negative resistance, not gram positive. But look at this. Our MRSA rates are also 50 to 60 percent. But we have come like that because our gram negative is 70 to 80 percent. So, guys, gone are the days. Hello. Ma'am, can't hear you. Ma'am, your voice is echoing, so I can't, or maybe you can text me. Does this data include hospital acquired MRSA and community acquired? Yes, yes. It's not only community acquired MRSA. Yes, you are right. It's a mixture of data. It's not uh, only HA or CA MRSA. Right? So you can see uh, hospital, uh, this MRSA is 50 to 60% very high rates uh, of MRSA even in India. Otherwise, we thought it's a problem of this. Okay? ESBL, Isme to hum undisputed word champion. Extended spectrum beta lectomase, enzymes produced by E. coli and Klebsiella, which make penicillin, cephalosporins, and monobactams resistant. That is the ESBL. The first ESBL was isolated in 1981. Okay? And since then, this is a superstar among them. This is the most successful resistant pathogen so far. Maybe after five years, it could be NDM. But right now, ESBL, we say, is the most successful uh, superstar one. The rates of ESBL in India is, and now I am talking of, when I say ESBL, uh, I am talking of hospital equality. Nosocomy ESBL is 60, 70, 80 percent plus. Community ESBL also, I have data from some hospitals, uh, some community uh, smaller cities, about 40 percent in UTI. Why ESBL was a watershed moment? Understand this thing. ESBL infection means you cannot use any smaller beta lactate. You can't use cephalosporins, you can't use amoxiclav. Even for sicker patients, you can't use peptides. So, your only drug of choice is carbapentase. So, kya hua? Pichle salve, because ESBL was so high, we jump ke carbapentase use kiya. But remember, the more you use them, the more you lose them. Because we used so much of carbapenem for ESPL, that led to carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae pseudomonas and excitobacteria. So the, so the fruits of ESBL management were offset by the scourge of CRE, CRP, and CRAP. Okay? That's why ESBL was a watershed uh, resistant pathogen. CRE, again, this is the most sinister. Yes, ma'am? Nothing, nothing. Please go ahead. CRE, this is the most sinister bug these days in the ICU. Subse zada tang klepsella kar raha hai Okay? CRE klepsella and see Indian rates are 50 to 60%. Now, guys, this you have to remember one thing and I think wo aage jake bhi aage in our uh, mechanisms of resistance. When we say carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, there are basically three types of CRE KPC, OXA, NDM. Three different types of enzymes. Okay, all three may carbapenem resistant, but their types are different KPC, OXA, NDM. Now, this is important to understand because the new drugs which are coming are specific for these three varieties. Now, KPC is among the carbapenemases, KPC is most common in US and some parts of Europe, China. So China, some parts of Europe and the entire US is mainly KPC predominant. OXA, the other part of Europe, some part of Middle East and to some extent in India, it's OXA. And the third is NDM which is called New Delhi Metallo-Beta-Lectomase. It was first found in Lahore. 
but somehow they give the name New Delhi Metal Company directly. Anyways, okay. So NDM is mainly found in Indian subcontinent and wherever you see medical tourism. Why I'm saying this? Remember, NDM like ESBL is plasmid mediated. Any resistant pathogen which is plasmid mediated spreads very rapidly. It is just one flight away from the other continent. What is plasmid? Extra chromosomal DNA, Avara DNA. It does not follow any hereditary patterns. It spreads resistance both vertically and horizontally. E. coli ne klebsella ko diya, klebsella ne aage de diya. Aisa wala resistance. You know, haphazard resistance. That was plasmid does. Why ESBL was so successful? It was plasmid mediated. That is the fear we have that NDM is also plasmid mediated. Right? And uh, you see NDM very commonly in E. coli. Or E. coli to pani mein bhi hai. So can you imagine the havoc that NDM can cause? There was a study, uh, Karolba, Delhi. Uh, the sewage water was full of NDM. Okay. So suppose I have diarrhea. I go and poo in Europe. I transmit the NDM uh, in the water of Europe. This is how resistance goes into the food chain. That's why the world is so worried about NDM. Okay. This could be the new superstar. NDM could be the new ESPF. Right now, it is mainly in Indian subcontinent and places where there is medical tourism. Australia, Thailand, Philippines, now China is also having this. So this is a very important pathogen we have to think. And so far, no drug in the market. No drug. There is drug for KPC already, Pfizer's Zevisepta or Septazine Zevisepta. But for NDM, there is no drug. Okay. Crab, Acinetobacter. अब ये पैथोजन ना इसको हमने जबरदस्ती अपना दुश्मन बना लिया एसिनेटोबैक्टर कोई खतरनाक पैथोजन नहीं है 1990 से पहले तक तो एसिनेटोबैक्टर को हम क्लासिफाई भी नहीं करते थे सेपरेटली फ्रॉम नॉन फर्मेंटर्स वी यूज्ड टू से नॉन फर्मेंटर वेदर इट इज सुडोमोनास और व्हाटएवर ओके इट्स अ वेरी मॉइस्चर लविंग पैथोजन सो आईसीयू सिंक्स आईसीयू पाइप्स Okay, curtains, you take samples, you will see asymptomatic. So it's not a pathogenic bacteria or a virulent bacteria like Clepsil. The reason acinetobacter has started killing is no drug works for it. It has become resistant to it. That is the reason acinetobacter is killing these days because it's basically not pathogenic or not very pathogenic. But bacteria, it's becoming resistant very fast. And you can see the whole world is uh, mostly now red or orange, 60-70%. Crab. And again, no new drugs still in the market. There is one new drug, Cephidropol, but India may not have yet, which covered, which deals with acidotobacter. But again, the problem is 70-80% resistance. Okay. I love to show this one slide. And I have titled it, Ignorance is not a bliss when it comes to your local antibiogram. Can anyone tell me from the audience? This is ceftriaxone, CI. This is E. coli and Klebsiella. What is the ESBL rate here? Or probable ESBL rate? Anyone? We discussed this yesterday, little bit. Okay, so we discussed kiya tha? If a third, if E. coli or Klebsiella is resistant to any third generation cephalosporin, it's a surrogate marker. It could be an ESP. Okay, now this data is from 2008. Imagine, 15 years And this is from a government hospital in Delhi. I went there for a CME, and I asked in the audience. What is your ESBL rate? So it, it, one of the doctors told me, uh, Dr. Ankur, we don't have ESBL in our hospital. Oh, I said, sir, that's great. But why do you say that? 
This is because our microbiologist never tells us that this ESG is happening. Okay. So, I said that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Okay. So, I told them, can you show me whatever data you have today? So, they gave me this one slide. They said, this is our data. And I said, guys, you are sitting on a volcano of ESGs. 89% of Klebsiella and E. coli have become resistant to ceftriaxone by a level of 89%. This could be your ESDL rate. And you say that our hospital is not ESDL because we have told you. So please, ignorance is not a bliss. It's your right to ask for the antibiogram and to read the antibiogram. Okay? That's why I'm saying practicing critical care today without antibiograms is shooting in the dark. So the Indian scenario, uh, I call this antibiotic anarchy in India. Okay. Aap random sample lije. Do this as a PG thesis for someone. Out of 100 discharged summaries, any department from psychiatry to diabetology, take discharge from this. 80% of them would have an antibiotic in the discharge. Along with an antacid, an NSAID, then maybe a multibiotic. So we have reduced antibiotics to the level of this. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Guidelines say single shot of profiles. One, one shot. That's it. My aunt was admitted in one of the biggest private hospitals in North India for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. She was given third generation cephalosporin 24 hours before and four days after while she was in the hospital. And when she was discharged, another five days of oral third generation cephalosporin. Okay. So that is our, because we have to that oral is not antibiotic. Oral is de-escalated. Right? Only IV is an antibiotic. That's wrong. Okay, we'll talk about it. But this is our situation. Our hospital environment is not conducive to protocol. Many say in India we follow evidence-based medicine, not eminence-based. Uh, eminence-based medicine, not evidence-based. Okay. Very few qualified ID specialists. Uh, I am from pharma company. We have also added to this chaos. Uh, Hindustan mein meropenem more than 150 brands. 2,500 ki bhi milti hai vial or 200 ki bhi milti hai. Right. So. Uh, I have seen GPs writing meropenem twice a day, 500 mg BD for enteric fever. So resistance kahan jai? So that is why there is antibiotic anarchy in India. That's why resistance rates are so high. Okay. okay. So this is all what has happened in India. What is the resistance rates, types of resistant bacteria, MDR, XDR, PDR. Now we will go, what are the mechanisms of resistance and how to interpret them. Ma'am, do we want to take a break? Yeah, just a minute. What happened? What happened? It's late. Okay, you can continue. So you just, ma'am, uh, ping me when you want to take a break. Yeah, okay. Okay. Mechanisms of resistance. I haven't seen a simpler diagram than this so far to define the four mechanisms of resistance, which are most common. So this diagram that you see, imagine this diagram is of bacteria. Now, my antibiotic has to enter inside and this red colored square that you see, that's the target site. It could be a protein, it could be a cell wall, it could be a cell membrane, whatever. That's a target site. So my antibiotic has to enter through two green gates and attach to this red site in order to start acting. Or bacteria ne kuch bhi karna hai taki ye na ho sake. Right? It will do anything possible to stop my antibiotic from attaching to this red site. And what all it does are the mechanisms of resistance. So first thing kya kar sakta hai? Gate bunker. Entry gate is closed. So this green gates, they are closed by bacteria. This is known as pore and loss. Okay. 
and it is so sophisticated that these porins are antibiotic specific it may close the porin for one drug but not for the other okay porin loss is a very common mechanism of resistance in gram negative bacteria especially klebsiella acinetobacter that's the first one porin loss second so suppose my antibiotic now entered inside and is slowly moving towards its beloved the red spot okay now what does it do it throws these yellow bugs what are these yellow bugs that you see these are enzymes beta lactamases their role is to break the beta lactam ring in the beta lactam antibiotics and make them ineffective among all mechanisms of resistance this is the most common mechanism of resistance in gram negative and generally also okay so the second mechanism the second villain here is these yellow dots which are the enzymes beta lactamases okay what is the third one now suppose my antibiotic is saved from porins saved from enzymes and is moving towards the red spot look at this light blue puffy structures these are efflux pumps what do they do they suck the antibiotic and throw it outside the exit gate even before it can leave the red spot that is efflux pumps again these efflux pumps are antibiotic specific classical example if your pseudomonas produces efflux pumps it will throw out meropenem but not imipenem okay so these are so highly uh, specific efflux pumps again very common mechanism in pseudomonas and klebsiella that we see and finally the fourth mechanism target site alteration jisko main kehta hu sanam bewafa okay why my bacteria was now saved from all three going towards its beloved and it changes shape okay it had its lock and key it changes shape target site modification so that my bacteria cannot attach there okay this is a very common mechanism of resistance in gram positive bacteria so these are one of the these are the four most common uh, mechanisms of it. the fifth one is a cell membrane uh, detergent like colistin you know you remove the cell membrane and it becomes very permeable the cell membrane becomes so permeable and the ph balance is disturbed bacteria die. okay that's the fifth one but the most common are these four and we will talk more in detail about the first one which is the beta lactamase because yahi se aate hain esgl cre carbapenemase kpc ndm these are all beta lactamases this basically okay another diagrammatic illustration uh okay see suppose this is how does target site modification work these red bars our target site the green balls were antibiotic it had to bind change its site okay change its shape so this is target site modification next decrease permeability or porin loss my green balls had to go through the red gates the red gates stop blocked cannot enter inside porin loss very common in gram negatives in pseudomonas uh antibiotic specific porins are there efflux pumps the green antibiotic is entering inside wanting to go to its target site it is exited sucks it pulls it pushes it out of the exit gate okay that's the efflux pump and finally these are beta lactamases these pink pellets these are the beta lactamases enzymes so when they join with my green antibiotic they break the beta lactam ring so my antibiotic is destroyed it can no longer enter inside so uh, this is the cartoon representation of the four most common mechanisms of resistance uh, this is uh, we all have to remember this Uh, this is the simplest classification of uh, beta lactamases we call it ambler classification okay the uh, four groups uh, group a c and d is serine 
ग्रुप बी इज मटेलो एंजाइम सो व्हाई देयर इज जिंक इन दैट ओके इन द स्टीरिन ग्रुप ग्रुप ए वी हैव फर्दर सब क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ द एंजाइम्स लाइक CTXM, KPC, TEM. Group D we have OXA. Group C MC. Group B IM, VIM, NDM. These are all names of different enzymes. Okay, and usually uh, these are named either after the cities from they were first isolated or the antibiotic that they hydrolyzed. Like NDM is New Delhi Metallo. imp is imipenemase it hydrolyzes in it like that okay the name tem tem it was the first patient timoneyara from where we isolated ye wahan se aaya so very interesting names so what are esdls esdl is tem shb and ctxm they are esdls and carbapenemase is imp vim ndm kpc oxa I am sorry, there is no easier way to remember this. Here, atta marne. Okay, so this is the one slide you have to remember. ESDL is stem, SHV, CTXM. Carbapenemase is IM, VIM, NDM, KPC, OXA. Okay. Now, this is a beautiful slide. It took me a lot of time to make this slide, uh, but please, I will say, take a printout and you can use this slide as your reference. Okay. Now, look at the y-axis. Uh, as we go down, we are increasing the severity of beta lactamase, starting from classical beta lactamase, then ESDL, then MC, then carbapenemase. Okay, so this is the rows and the columns. So which isolates produce these enzymes? Next column is what antibiotics are affected, and final column is which antibiotics are not affected. And you can still use. It. I find this the one slide very useful to remember. so what are classical beta lactamases they are produced by most gram negative bacilli and some gram positive purane wale shuru ke jo 50 60 mein aate okay which antibiotics don't work or are affected penicillin ampicillin amoxicillin and first generation cephalosporin cephalexin they don't work what will still work so what you can use Second, third, fourth generation cephalosporin, BL, BLI, SQNM, carbapenem. Okay, simple. Now come to ESBL. ESBL is the resistant variety of the classical. Okay, who produces them? Mainly gram-negative E. coli Klebsiella. Which antibiotics don't work? Above, which means penicillin, MP, amoxy also. Plus, second, third, fourth generation and SQNM are also gone. They can't be used. What still works? Carbapenems, digicycline, phosphomycin, and nitrofurantoin only for UTI. These are the oral options I told you yesterday. And the BL BLIs, imipenem, relibactam is the new BLI. Meropenem, vaporbactam, ceftazidime, avibactam, piprasentazobactam. These are the newer BL BLIs. Okay. But drug of choice for ESBLs remain carbapenems for sicker patients and Magnex or Piptazo for less sick patients. If a patient with ESBL is in sepsis, don't use Piptazo. There is a complete study now which shows mortality is high, so there is no such uh, confusion now. Simple patient not sick, not hapvap, uh, simple UTI, uh, pyelonephritis for example, or an intra-abdominal infection in the ward, you can use a Piptazo. But in ICU, sick, bloodstream infections, hapvap, carbapenem. Okay, MC, MC, ESBL का बड़ा भाई है. The only difference between MC and ESBL is in MC, BL, BLI is also don't work. In ESBL, carbapenem, uh, sorry, BL, BLI is work. But in MC, BL, BLI is also don't. Works so drug of choice remains carbapenem or digicycline, and the final one is carbapenemase enzymes which hydrolyze carbapenems. We have KPC, MDLs, MBL का full form metallo beta lactamase. Why metallo? They have zinc in them. The class uh, B, okay, imp with MDM, 
NDM is the most common MDL, plasmid mediated, I told you. And then even in OXA, we have different types, OXA 23, 48, 40, 58. The most common is OXA 48, which is Clepsa. Who produces them? Clepsella pseudoacinator. Kya chala jata isme? Everything is gone. Penicillin, DL, DLI, cephalosporin, even karma penicillin. Drug of choice, cholestin, digicycline, or your newer, three newer drugs. Kazavi, Kazavis, Ceftazidim, Evibactam, Meropenem, Vaborbactam, Imipenem, Relibactam. But ek baad yaad rakhu, ye tino kaam karti hai only KPC, not in India. Or India mein ke hai, mainly India. Iravacycline is a new drug, still not launched in India. Plasmomycin is a new drug, not launched in India. Staphyderopol is a new drug, not launched in India. So in India, what the doctors are doing right now to treat NDM is colistin plus phosphomycin or colistin plus tigicide. Or what they are doing, Kazavi, which is Pfizer's drug, Ceftazidim and Bactam, Plus estriol. This combination is used a lot. Why? Kazavi. Saftazidin ejectum will kill OXA and KPC. Estriolam kills NDM. Together, these two give a full coverage. Okay? Because in India, we don't have Irava, Plazo, Cephiderocol, Meropenem, nothing we have. We have only colistin, tidycycline, phosphomycin. Septazidim, Avibactam, and Estriol. 